Hi, I'm Dan Costa, Editor-in-Chief of PCMag.com, and welcome to Fast Forward, where we have conversations about living in the future. My guest today is Chris Ermson. He is the CEO of Aurora, which is one of the largest and most successful self-driving car companies in the country, and you may not have heard of it before, um, but they've been around for a while and they've done some fascinating things. Chris, thanks so much for talking to me today. Oh, thanks for having me. It's great. So I was watching the documentary Autonomy last night, and you show up in the first five minutes um, talking about self-driving cars, um, and basically announced that one of the reasons you're in this business is so that you know your son will not have to get a driver's license. Um, can you just talk a little bit about like how that motivates you and 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 what Aurora does? Yeah. So so Aurora, we're a company. We're building self-driving car technology. So we don't build the car. Uh, we don't think really uh, about building the application. So ride hailing or whatnot. We think about how do we build a really safe driver. Uh, and so we've been at it for a couple of years. We're a couple hundred people at this point. Uh, and you know, really what gets us up in the morning is all the, the benefits you can see from this technology, right? We can, we can save lives on the road. Uh, we can make transportation more accessible. We can make cities more livable. For me, um, I think, you know, I, I have two awesome, awesome sons. Uh, and if you look at the kind of fatality curves for uh, for driving, you know, where you think age and you know probability that something terrible happens, it looks like a bathtub. So the youngest new drivers and then and then old drivers, they're they're in these accidents more often. And so, getting this technology out in the world so that so that young people like my kids um, don't have that risk, um, parents don't have to worry about it, seems like a you know it is exciting and meaningful. It seems like, a, and I think that's an important point that. You know, there's two sort of reasons for building self-driving cars. You know, the engineering drive just because we can. Um, we know we have a problem, we can solve it, and we can solve it with engineering. But um, fundamentally, this is a safety issue. Yeah. And there's 40,000 deaths every year on, on, uh, on for, and, and the vast majority of those are because of human error. And this is what this technology is designed to prevent. That, that's exactly right. So in, in America alone, 40,000 people every year, 1.3 million globally, right? That's incredible. Somebody. Um, was like two and a half people a minute uh, die in traffic accidents around the world. And something like 96% of those accidents are due to human error. So uh, that means that we can do something about it, right? We can build technology that is always paying attention to the road. It isn't kind of figuring out whether there's a new text message that came in or being distracted in the car or, or just fallen asleep or had too many drinks, right? It, it's technology that is paying attention the whole time and just as good the whole time when it's operating. And I think that's that's incredible. And I I feel very lucky to work in a space where, like you said, the technology itself is just cool, right? Like it's broad and interesting and it's a neat problem. Um, it's tangible, right? You can go touch the car, you can see it when it gets better. Uh, but then it has this opportunity to have a profound impact again in safety, but you know, transportation touches everything. The, um, you know, I wanted to ask you if, um a lot of companies have come out and said that this is happening. We know that it's being it's under development. But there were a lot of predictions made that, like 2020, there would be fleets of autonomous dry, uh, cars out there on the road. A lot of those predictions have sort of been walked back a little bit. Yeah. Like, how do you see the timeline developing? Like, how far are we in this process? What are the hurdles, and, and when is it going to happen in a big way? Yeah, I think none of us really understood just how hard this problem was, right? I'm, you know, I famously said that one of my you know, my older son, I'd like him to not have to get a driver's license and that, you know, we, we'd get there. And it turns out he's going to be 15 and a half in, I think, two months, which means he can get a learner's <laughs> permit. And so obviously we're, we're not quite, quite a there. Deadline you've right. yourself. We're, we're not quite there yet. Um, you know, and so the way we think about this at Aurora is our, our mission is to deliver the benefits of self-driving technology safely, quickly, broadly. Uh, and so we, we want to get to that point where we're delivering that core, core benefit of it. But behind that, we feel this urgency to, to move, to get the technology into market, start saving lives, and, you know, and, and start making it easier to get around. Um, you're right, people have walked back these timelines. I think there's a lot of people who have um, limited experience in the space, and they're kind of guessing. And, and so now, as we more deeply understand it, I think within the next five years, you'll start to see kind of the, the early, early small-scale deployments of this technology. Once we get to that, it'll start to scale relatively quickly. But this is a, you know, this is a change that's going to scale in over over decades, not over kind of weeks. What are, what are the 
what are the obstacles you're worried about? Are they, are they technical obstacles? Are they legal obstacles? Um, are they moral obstacles? And that it, it's gonna take time to figure out how to yeah. program these algorithms to work, make the decisions that we want them to make. I think we, we're gonna face a sequence of challenges, right? I think the, the first one that, that unlocks it is actually getting the technology that it's good enough uh, to be out there. And, and that's really still hard, right? The, you know, if you read some of the breathless headlines out there, you, you, you'd believe that the technology was done and you could buy it today. Mm -hmm. um, you can't. Uh, and so there's, there's a bunch of work there to, to both build the technology and convince ourselves it's good enough. Um, as the technology reaches readiness, then we get into the mode of, of how do we most thoughtfully introduce this? How do we, you know, as the technology moves from kind of the fantasy promise of what it can be to the reality of what's happening on the street, that's where you, you see some of the, the bad events happen. Uh, and so there we need to have kind of done our job educating society, educating regulators, educating lawmakers around this is why we're building it. These are some of the bumps we might see along the way, but you know, if we get from here to the end state, we're gonna be much safer, we're gonna be much better. Uh, so kind of work with us through those, and I think that will be the, the next phase of, of challenge for us. So uh, when you talk about um, the sort of moral complexity of building self-driving cars, it's, it is more complicated than, than most um, engineering projects, um, and people keep bringing up the trolley problem, and the trolley, uh, um, can you explain the trolley problem and, and then how, what's your take on solving that? Yeah, so, so the trolley problem is this kind of philosophical question of uh, imagine you have a trolley coming down a track uh, and it's out of control. And there's, you know, I don't know, let's say there's a nun on one branch and then there's a second branch where there's a, you know, a convict. A convict. Uh, and you have the opportunity to kind of throw the lever where you could divert it from hitting the nun to hitting the convict. What's the right thing to do, right? Should you, and, and you can vary at this, you know, it's three children versus an old man, you know, there's, there's all kinds of kind of, it's really a question uh, that allows us to um, explore how do we value uh, life and different aspects of life in our society. Uh, where it gets translated into the self-driving car space is, you know, you're kind of in an inevitable collision state, what do you do? And, and the short answer is there's no correct answer, right? You know, philosophers have wrestled with this problem for centuries. Uh, and it's really, it's what do we as a society together believe is the right thing to do? The good news is that self-driving cars should be much more alert, right? They, they're going to be better defensive drivers, so we should really you know, very rarely, if ever, encounter this. I, I don't know if in your lifetime you've ever had to pick between, you know, crashing into the wall or, or you know, crashing into a person on the road. Yeah, uh, it's, uh, it's, I mean, most people don't have to think those things out. Yeah. Um, and we fall back on human error, right. where you can make the wrong decision. You can right. do the wrong thing, and bad things will happen, and you're only so responsible for making that mistake. Agreed, but also you live with the consequences, right? I think this is the part that's, the, that's kind of missed. So one is people almost never have this happen. Uh, Self-driving cars will have it happen even less. The first premise in this is, is that people do the right thing. And there's been studies that show that in those kind of instantaneous events, it never gets to kind of reasoning about, you know, which life is more valuable. It is an instantaneous reaction that does something. Yeah. Uh, and then the person who made that decision has to live with the consequences for the rest of their life, right? And I think that's, that's, that's truly terrible. So what we, the way I think about this is um, let's make it basically not happen. When it does, and then let's describe how we, what, what the outcome might be, right? We might say that the right thing is the car will work hardest to avoid vulnerable road users, pedestrians mm -hmm. and cyclists. And then after that, it'll work the next hardest to avoid uh, other vehicles on the road. And after that, it'll worry about not hitting, um, you know, not hitting uh, walls and buildings. Mm -hmm. And so you can express that, and then people can say, well, I don't want to ride in that car. Or they're like, okay, I can live with that. And, you know, particularly knowing that it's basically not a risk and move on. And, and that's a, you know, we can propose that as the people delivering the technology. And then over time, this will turn into a societal conversation around, you know, what is the, the preferred outcome here. 
what I think the most important thing is to not let kind of the perfect here, particularly when the perfect doesn't exist, mm -hmm. um, to be the enemy of getting something, have an incredible benefit out on the road. That's a great point. I want to be respectful of your time and ask you the questions I ask everybody that comes on the show. Um, is there a technology trend that concerns you and that keeps you up at night? So I think one of the things I, I think about a lot uh, is, um, and it came up on the panel this morning, uh, one of the things I think about a lot is the kind of asymmetric, uh, asymmetry of, of some technologies. So, you know, we, the connected world, the Internet of Things, um, if something goes bad, it can have a profoundly broad impact, right? There, there isn't kind of um, uh, diversity in the ecosystem, and that means one kind of point, point failure can bring down a lot of technology. And so as companies get larger and larger, technology kind of footprints get larger and larger and kind of more homogeneous, how do we protect against that? How do we provide diversity and immuni uh, communication, immunity uh, in, into the technology? So. And is there a technology or a service uh, that you use every day that still inspires wonder? I think there's a lot of that, right? I, I, I see it all around. I, I, you know, I'm an engineer, and the more I, time I spend on things, the, the more uh, it's clear how complicated pretty much everything is, right? And whether it is the fact that the cell phone in my pocket allows me to be simultaneously looking up you know, whatever fact while talking to my parents up in Canada, right, you know, that's incredible. Uh, the fact that I have a car on my driveway that, you know, came off the line one minute before the car after it um, and has little explosions going off under the hood and, you know, for the next 15 years, it's just going to work, right? That's incredible. You know, the fact we flew here on a plane, right, and it's this giant thing with a couple hundred people in it and, you know, and it stays up in the air. Right, that's awesome, right? I think, I think it's, um, there's a lot of uh, anxiety, I think, in society right now. And uh, when you take a step back and kind of look at, you know, the magic of, of everyday life, it's, it's pretty profound. Yeah, I try and remind myself every time I take off in an airplane that this is a pretty extraordinary. It, it, it's, it's really incredible, you know, right? I'm be in another city yeah. in four hours, and then I'm gonna fly back. and. And, and magic, right? Yes. And and then how do I not gripe about the fact that the Wi-Fi on it sucks, right? <laughs> I, I flew in today and the Wi-Fi did suck and, and, and lots of people were complaining about it. Uh, yes, and yet we all got there. And, yeah. Yeah, so. Chris, thanks so much for taking the time to talk to me. Uh, how can people follow you and follow what Aurora is doing? Uh, so we have a website. Um, uh, it's pretty limited, uh, www.aurora.tech. Uh, and we were on Twitter. Very cool. Thanks. Thanks again. That's Fast Forward. I'm, I'm Dan Kostler, in chief of PCMag.com. And if you want to see back episodes of the show, you can find them on PCMag.com, on iTunes, or anywhere fine podcasts are given away for free. Thanks for joining us, and I'll see you in the future.